This episode is brought to you by P3 Recovery. We see the trophies, the goals, the celebrations on the podium, the moments that create sporting history. But what really is behind these moments? The backstory will take you into the life behind the athlete to really understand what's led them to success. Pretty Boy Zarafa told anyone who would listen at the age of 12 that he was going to be a boxing world champion. So confident in his ability as a young teenager, he wrote a letter to his idol, Anthony Mundine, telling him one day he would beat him in the ring and end his career. Spoiler alert, he got his wish. But before that dream was realised, Michael was faced with his toughest day in the ring. Dwight Ritchie, his friend and sparring partner, died suddenly in front of him. I met Mick during filming of SAS Australia and was blown away by his kindness. He is an incredible athlete with a beautiful spirit and I'm grateful to him for opening up to us during today's episode. Michael Zarafa, thank you for joining me on The Backstory. It's good to see you. The first time we met was on SAS Australia, a whole Don't different remember. world, a whole Don't different remember. world away. Sadly, your time was cut short pretty quickly, but did you take anything out of that experience? Uh, yeah, not to, not to crawl on the sand because <laughs> um, yeah, I suffered with a pretty serious injury and unfortunately my time got cut short, but um, it, was, it was definitely um, something to remember for sure. Let's, uh, let's start right from the beginning. Talk to me about your childhood, your parents, what was it like? Uh, it was pretty crazy. I mean, uh, I was always up to no good. I would always be running around. If I was quiet, I was always doing something bad. But at a young age, I said to myself, I want to be a world champion. At seven years old, I told my, my mum and dad that one day I'm going to sell out stadiums and, you know, and be a world champion. And I never, I never lost faith. No matter how hard it got, how hard it got, I never lost faith. And, um, and yeah, I just never looked back and now I'm number two in the world. So how does a, a seven-year-old boy all of a sudden decide he wants to, to box and be a world champion? Where does that come from? Is there someone else in the family or is it something no. you saw? I, um, I just saw that all you needed was a bit of dedication, a bit of discipline, and you know, I could change my friends and family's life. And for me, that was the motivation. You know, to, I never came from a rich family and I never got given anything. I had to do it all tough. And knowing that you know, when I was watching the fights at a young age, I'm like, I could beat these guys. You know, at 13 years old, I was calling out Anthony Mundine in his prime. <laughs> But um, I just knew that one day it was inevitable, it was gonna happen for me. And um, it's weird when I, when I have interviews and stuff like this and I try to explain my seven-year-old mindset and my 30-year-old mindset, it, it is exactly the same. I, as dark as it's been and you know, the, the hard times, I've always said it's gonna happen, no matter what. So what about boxing? What, is it the, the fight? Is it the preparation? Is it the arena? Like, what about it? It's just the, the give back. For me, it's always been about give back. And to be in a position where, you know, kids can look up to you and you can give back, like I said, to my friends, my family, you know, the future of the sport, that's what my motivation is. You know, I, for me, I don't really fight. I, I tell everyone, like, I, I died years ago. I don't really care about myself. It's about what I bring. And if I can change the world by, you know, 1%, or give back to somebody and change someone else's life. That's what it's always been about for me. And I do that now, I try to do that now and help and um, just share a little bit of wisdom that I've learnt in my 30 years to the next gen. So I read somewhere that at 12 you were doing double training sessions. Yeah, yeah. So what, is, what does 12 year old Michael look like? Oh mate, he had this big mullet, it was disgusting. <laughs> but I mean, he was again the same, just dedicated and just a strong mindset. You know, I just, nothing's impossible. You know, everyone, everyone has two arms and a head and bleeds red. It's who wants it more. And that's every fight I go in, that's what I say to myself. You know, he's exactly the same as me. There's no difference. It's who wants it more. It's the want and uh, the heart in the fight. And for me, I, I've always had that. Ever, ever since a young kid, I've always just, I was the first in, last out. Um, even with my cousins and stuff, I'd always be punching on. You know, I'd always be getting bullied, but I'd always come back for more. And um, yeah, like I said, for me, it's, it's just that, that end goal of being a world champion and, and giving back. But at 12, where does it, like, who's telling you to do two sessions a day? You've got to go to school. You've probably got to want to hang out with your mates. I'm sure you had to take the rubbish out for your mum or something like that. So, <laughs> so where, where does all, how does it all look? Well, for me, I used to, like, literally wag school 
and go, my lunch money was to give to my boxing trainer <laughs> at 12 years old. And um, yeah, like for, for me, I never wanted to be at school. I, it was just literally at seven years old, I said, after watching a few fights, I'm like, I'm going to be a world champion. So every time I was at school, I was always you know, misbehaving and always up to no good. And mm -hmm. my mum and dad always getting calls saying, you know, come pick up your kid because he's up to, you know, he's done something wrong. <laughs> so, cause I knew where I was gonna go and where mm -hmm. I wanted to be and school wasn't for me. I just couldn't do it. And um, I had to keep myself busy. So I thought, well, instead of sitting around playing Xbox and PlayStation, Let's, let's get on the track, let's get in the boxing gym, let's train, let's make my time you know, useful. So, the letter to Anthony Mundine, you spoke about Anthony just briefly <laughs> before. T tell me what, what was said, yeah. like what in your mind was like, I'm gonna write to Anthony Mundine, who at the time was probably one of you know, the, the best, greatest. Yeah, well I've always idolised him. I know it was more crazy the fact that I was 13 and thought I could beat Mundine, or the fact that he replied, but <laughs> at 13 years old, I literally went on, I think it was MySpace back then, and I said, you know, one day I wanna fight and retire you. And uh, he replied back, surprisingly. It's pretty bold for a 30 year old. Yeah, I was like, we're walking around, I was like, you know, and he goes, if you're looking to be beat, I'm the man to meet. And I left him on scene. Um, and funny enough, 15 years later, I ended up fighting him and retiring him and knocking him out. So yeah, it's a pretty cool story. But again, champion of the sport, put the sport on the map. You know, as Anthony Mundine to me is a superstar. And now a mentor when I fight. We'll come back to the fight a little bit later. But tell me about your very first fight, your very first time you, you stepped in the ring and, and you had a fight on your hands. Can you remember that or what, what it was oh, yeah. like? It was, I absolutely shit myself. It was the scariest thing. I, was, I actually got there and thought, what am I doing now? You know, but like I said to you before off camera, this is the best place and the most scariest place to be is in a, in a ring. Um, but I knew as soon as I got there, this, it, it was home for me. You know, from every time I step into a ring, no matter what's going on outside my life or, you know, outside of the boxing gym, as soon as I step in here, it's, it's showtime. And, um, who, who was that opponent? Do you uh, remember? Ben Caps. Yeah, he's he ends up turning professional. Had not, not a bad record, but he's retired now. Um, but yeah, he was three or four fights in. It was my first fight, so I was going up a guy that was a bit more experienced than me, and you know he had a few wins under his belt. But for me, I, I didn't care. I just wanted to get in there and and showcase my ability, which was pretty shocking back then. But <laughs> um, yeah, I got the win. I ended up knocking him out, which was pretty cool in the mm -hmm. first round, and and I never looked back. I just yeah said, this is it. Who's next? And. Uh, Michael Pretty Boy Zarafa. So tell me, I, I need to know where, did you, yeah, is that self-appointed nickname? I tried to shake it off so many times. Yeah, I said to him, why can they give me the destroyer or the bomber or something? I tried, it's not for my looks. I, um, it was just for my style in the, in the amateurs. I was very neat, very, you know, pretty, they said. And every time I had the same ring announcer consecutively and he just kept saying, you know, the Pretty Boy Zarafa, Pretty Boy Zarafa. And <clears throat> I couldn't get rid of it. And then funny enough, funny enough when I turned professional, it was the same ring announcer. And he kept, you know, giving me my announcement, me as the MC, as pretty boy, and I was like, fuck, I couldn't shake it off, and, <laughs> and now stuck. it's just stuck. So I'm just rolling with it. When did life for you go from I'm I'm pretty good, I want to be world champion, to I actually think I will be world champion. This is going to happen for me. Like Seven when years was old. that? Seven years old. And that's you were, what I you say. That, uh, you knew it then. I knew, and that's why I say to people like, uh, people can back me up. You know, I, I wish I could sh somehow you know, show it or, you know, like seven years old, I was like, I'm going to be a world champion. Mm -hmm. And I know it's inevitable for me now. Now, no matter, the world could end and I'm still going to be a world champion. Like it's, it's so weird. So tell me about, you, you moved overseas and, and trained over there for a while. Tell me about that experience. Yeah, I was living uh, in LA. It was pretty rough. Um, I went there by myself and I was training at the best gym in the world, Wildcard, which obviously Manny Pacquiao's mm -hmm. gym there for head trainer, Freddie Roach. Um, it was crazy, you got guys like Mark Wahlberg just strolling in watching Pacquiao train, Sylvester Stallone, and it's, uh, it's the real deal over there. And I just strolled in, um, you know, this Aussie just chasing a dream. And I was like, oh, I want to spar him, and I want to spar him. I'm trying to call shots. <laughs> like, mate, just go get a bag. And, and then I had to earn my way up. And you know, they saw me hit the bag and they said, oh, you know, Aussie, jump in. And um, they ended up sparring one of their boys and ended up dropping him. And they're like, you yeah, this kid's pretty good. And they said, no, come back on Wednesday, come downstairs. And that's where all the boys were. And I walked in Tuesday, uh, Wednesday morning and uh, Miguel Cotto, you know, all these world champions are in there. And I said, you know, this is for me. This is where I need to be. You know, I'm getting chills thinking about it now, just going back there and I was like, this is like life. So know? what do you take from that experience? Not only as a fighter, but as a person, like you're, you're a young kid. He hasn't yeah. really done a lot on the big stage. What do you, what do you take out of that experience? Uh, for me, like just being around all those guys and I love learning, you know, I'll learn off a five-year-old kid. If they're going to give me advice, I'm like, oh yeah, you know, I'll, I'll take it. And when I went in there, I was just like, I didn't care about the training. I was just trying to adapt to what they do mm -hmm. because 
people tell me I do things wrong or you know I'm doing things too much and so I wanted to really rub shoulders with these guys and, and find out what the right and wrong things are because they've done it you know mm -hmm. and I want to learn from these guys that have been there and done it so for me uh, like 18 and 20 years old you know sparring Miguel Cotto to me that's my I've named my dog after him you know like <laughs> he's my absolute favorite fighter and um, you know I walked in he's like Mick we're doing some rounds today and I was like man you know again I was just like the happiest I was like a little girl having a crush and I was like, oh my god you know this is, <laughs> this is phenomenal but it, for me it was just like this is where I need to be mm -hmm. for me this is confirmed that I need to be and I want to be a world champion and a boxer. See how he gets it done here. Good right hand by Zarafa found a little bit of a hole in the defenses of Quirlin. Wow, back and forth action. He wants to open it up now. I was watching some of your highlights while we were uh, preparing for this interview. The fight with Peter Quillen, uh, oh. a knockout, uh, it was it's, it's brutal. Yeah. Is that was that one of the worst knockouts you've had, or, or tell me about? <laughs> yeah, look, I I probably shouldn't have taken that fight, mm -hmm. but at a young kid, I got offered a world title to fight the biggest puncher in the division, undefeated, 32 fights, 32 wins with 30 knockouts. Um, but again, you know, I heard the, the dollar signs, I heard the opportunity, and I was like, yeah, let's let's just do it. You know, I'm, I'm a ballsy guy. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'll just I'll take the risk. But um, you know, it didn't end well for me. Um, I got hit with a big hook that I didn't see, and I actually suffered uh, with brain bleeds and you know, damaged a little bit of my, my right eye, uh, my vision. But I mean, I bounced back. You know, they said to me I probably should never box again. But a month later, I was down in Australia, back home, and I was fighting. I was like, let's go. We've got to build back. You know, we've got to bounce back. It's all about the bounce back. So, what do you learn from that experience? What Keep you your hands up. <laughs> Keep your hands up. Don't be too eager. But um, look, you got to. For me, if you haven't lost. We haven't been knocked down, you haven't fought anybody. And um, for me, it was, it was just to, to make me tougher, to make me who I am today. So for, for an everyday person, you see that footage and you just go, you know, you, you sort of can't even imagine, can't even comprehend what, you know, what you've gone through. So what is the next week, month, like, what does it look like for recovery in order to get your body healthy and, and back to being able after to fight? After that photo, in yeah, general? Uh, after, yeah. Um, after that fight, well, I got rushed straight, obviously, to hospital and stuff, and um, yeah, I had brain bleeds and stuff like that, and um, it wasn't good, you know. But a normal, I pretty much the next morning or straight after the fight, I'm back in the gym. You know, people say, oh, "But you, you fought yesterday." I'm like, "Exactly." You know, that was yesterday. We're, we're moving mm -hmm. forwards. Today's a new day. You know, don't change what's working. Um, so oh, I've got a ritual after every fight. I run. I, I go into a, a big run, eight, ten k kilometers. Yeah, run. The, it's crazy. The, the night of the fight. Yeah, literally. <laughs> you know, I might get back at four in the morning after you know the venue because we fight at you know twelve o'clock or whatever it is, and yeah, I'll get back and I'll go for a, for a ten k run. Yeah, it's nuts. Now that I think about it, here I mean, it doesn't actually <laughs> but is, sound normal. Is that you don't have to do that? I mean, no, is no, that you just, don't have to. It's just why? Why do you do that? I just for me, I just like to. It's like I run with God. Like it's weird, and it's just like you know, thank you. Um, you know, I get real spiritual when it comes to my fights, and a big believer, um, which I should always be, but mm -hmm. a bit more than. When it comes to fire time, but I just go and just therapeutic, and I just you know, thank you, you know, mm -hmm. my blessings, and oh, it's in the bank, it's mm -hmm. done now, and we just on to the next. Yeah, so it's like a reward, like I yeah. run. Sounds nuts. No, it doesn't. It just <laughs> it's just sounds crazy. Trying to get an understanding of where your head's at at that time. Yeah, look, I've got so many mixed emotions, and it's like, you know, uh, I've I've won. Like now, what, what, what can we do? Mm -hmm. You know, a normal person will go drink beer and eat crap. It's like, nah, man. Like for me. I like looking good, I like feeling good, and it's working. So let's just keep doing it. Yeah. I read that you said your favourite fight has been um, with Kell Brook in Sheffield 2018. Yeah. Why, why that fight? Uh, so I had three things on my, my list, my bucket list or my boxing list, and that was um, beat Anthony Mundine or fight Anthony Mundine, have Michael Buffer as my ring announcer and win a world title. Mm -hmm. And that fight I got the, the luck or the, you know, the opportunity to have him as my ring announcer. And, Sheffield Arena, 20,000 people. Cal Brooks, who I'm a huge fan of. Um, you know, I watched him when I was literally like 10 years old, winning world titles. To then have him in my you know, corner, opposite mm -hmm. corner, and having Michael Buffer as my ring announcer, I was like, you know, match room promotion, Eddie Hearn. I'm like, this is it, I've made it. You know? mm -hmm. And I learned so much from the fight. Everyone thought I was going to get knocked out in the first round. And I was looking that way. You know, I broke my nose in the first round, cut me open. And I was like, shit, you know, I don't really want to be here. This is tougher than I thought. But I found second win and went 12 rounds with him. And, got fight of the night and earned so much respect and 
that's where everyone saw that this kid's going to be, you know, a, a world champion. This is where I earned all my respect, and um, I learned so much from that fight. I know you've obviously got a huge amount of confidence in yourself and your ability, but are there times in that moment, for example, that you're going, okay? Oh yeah, every this, round. This kid, this kid's, you know, from Melbourne, and, and look where we are now. Yeah, 100%. I say all the time, I'm just a local kid. I'm like, it's it's crazy. Like even when I go to local gyms, people, will, I'll walk in just to do my session, like. Man, like they freak out because I was struggling. Like, what are you doing now? I'm like, I'm just Michael's a rapper. I'm just a <laughs> local boy from Craigie Van, you know. And um, but I, don't, I never get ahead of myself, and that's that's one of the keys, you know. I, I always just stay present. I never get ahead. I never think what's next. I'm always present. And that's been a huge key to my success. Mm -hmm. And I was never like that. Mm -hmm. I was always thinking about the past, and it would always make me depressed. And then I'd think about you know the future, and it'd give me anxiety. And I'm just like, you know what? I'm, I'm here right mm -hmm. now. And that's what I do when I'm in the fight. I'm like, you know. It's a 12 round fight and people are like, how do you get through 12 rounds? And I only think about it in the 12th round. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh shit, I'm 12 rounds in, you know. I'm, I think round by round, first round. And I'll sit back in the corner, I'll tell myself, let's do one more round. Mm -hmm. We've got one more round, Mick, let's go. And I'll talk to myself. And then each round's one more round. And then before you know it, it's the 12th and final round. And you're like, I'm here now, you know. And if it stops early, it stops early. That's, that's God's work, you know. Mm -hmm. But for me, I just, the hard work's done. I back my ability. I feel good, I look good. The rest is all in, uh, in God's hands. Can we talk about what happened with Dwight Ritchie? Yeah, Obviously yeah. a really dark time in your life and, and a dark time for boxing in general. Can, can you tell me a little bit about that day or yeah. from your point of view? It was literally the worst day of my life and I hope no one ever has to go through that, ever. Um, me and Dwight, we, I was lucky enough to share the ring with him thousands of times. You know, we fought each other twice as an amateur. Uh, we one each, he beat me once, I beat him once and we'll just always one and two, two and one, you know, we're always competing against each other, the two best in the country. Uh, we did thousands of rounds of sparring in this particular sparring session. We we're both in our training camps for our big fights. I was fighting Jeff Horn, he was fighting Tim Zhu. Um, and yeah, it just, he looked a little off and I, I just, we couldn't figure out what was going on. He was very quiet, you know, he's a quiet, quiet dude. And, we were just sparring and I hit him with a few shots and it was very unlikely, like, you know, because he doesn't usually get hit with shots like that and, you know, his, his timing and everything just started diminishing and, and then, you know, at one point he just looked at me and as I hit him, he just collapsed and um, I still remember, you know, he was just looking at me and he's like, you know, help and I'm, I'm looking at him, I took his mouth, got out and the team, our teams have run in and it was just, you know, he's started turning blue and I was like, you know, what is happening? Um, and then, yeah, he, the ambulance ended up coming and it was just a full scene and they told me, they said, where's Mick? And um, they said, look, we, we were meant to work for 45 minutes, but we're, you know, 25 minutes in and no response. Um, so Dwight Richie has been real dead. And um, people say, how do you get over it? And I haven't, you don't, you don't, you can't get, you can't get over that. You know, someone who, you know, I looked up to and, and you know we shared the ring so many times to then just see him die in front of you and if I felt like it was because of me you know and to then go to the funeral and have to face family and stuff like that it was just it was it was tough it was tough but I had to fight on and if you know do I want me to fight on because I, I, I contemplated my career I was like you know should I just give it away you know after seeing that I didn't know if I could I could continue and I was three weeks out of my fight with Jeff Horn in the rematch and I said, you know what, Dwight would want me to continue on and that's what I did. So I, I you know, went out there with the Aboriginal flag and fought for him and his people and, and soldiered on. But you can never get over it. It's still in my head every day. Thank you for sharing every day, that. Yeah, it's tough. How do, you, how do you get back in the ring for that fight against Jeff Horn? What, where are you in mentally? Uh, look, no excuses. I'm humble in victory, humble in defeat. Um, mentally, I was all over the place. Mm -hmm. I actually said to my brother before we walked out, he looked at me, he goes, you ready? I said, nah. I said, but let's go, let's just go. Let's walk out there. The people are here. You know, people have flown all around the country. We, you know, Fox Sports, main event. You know, let's do it. You know, we're here now. And no, no excuses. Jeff Horn was the better man on that night in the rematch. Um, just wasn't my night. And that, that's, everything happens for a reason. Mm -hmm. And that was, God, that was God's plan. Because now I'm here, I'm number two in the world. You know, if I had won that fight, who knows what mm -hmm. could have happened. So for me, I'm grateful and I'm, I'm, I'm here now. And I'm, like I said, I just stay present, so. There's one thing to go through an experience like that. And that's a very personal experience. But then to be in the public eye and have headlines and people yeah. talking, 
How did you deal with that part of it? That was the hardest, um, you know, despite everything that happened, you know, I was literally getting messages on social media saying, well, how do you feel? You're, you know, you, you killed a dad from his kids and this and that. And it was hard, you know, because then I started you know, on the news, you know, aspiring session, tragic, Marcus Rafa takes life. And it was like, what? Like, that was not the case, you know. Mm. Dwight Ritchie sadly un had other under underlining issues, uh, health issues, and um, it was out of my hands. You know, if he went for a run that morning, Sadly, yeah, they would have found him. Um, but yeah, well, it was tough, and I just had to keep soldiering on. I just kept, I just kept reminding myself the end goal, that world, world title, mm -hmm. you know, and what I'm doing it for. And he just added to that. You know, I'm the person that I'm fighting for. Um, and yeah, like I said, you're just, it's nothing, it's something you can never, you can't, how do you get over something like that? You can't, you know, I've, I've never seen someone die. Right, Another number to the resume, brother. Turn up, baby. Just turn up. Get no heart. Anthony Mundine, the fight with him. The man. You had him as your idol. Why was he your idol? Why was Anthony the idol? Oh, he just, he was, he was a king. He just, everything he did, the flamboyance, just, you know, dominated two sports, rugby, then to boxing. He was just what I wanted to be. And um, now I've got that, that label now, <laughs> the Maltese Mundine, but... I mean, like, he was just, he did it all, you know, and for me, I was like, I, I want to beat Mundine, you know, I'm going to beat Mundine, and I, I literally said it at 12 years old, 13 years old, I said, I'm going to beat him one day, I'm going to retire him, and I had managers, I had promoters, I had everyone say, no, nah, you're not going to, you know, you, I mean, you're 12 years old, you know, how are you ever <laughs> going to fight, and I said, it's going to happen, and um, for me, it just fell the way it fell, I was the champion, and then he actually called me out, and, you know, I should have been angry, but I was like, oh, man, Mundine's calling me out, you know, this is cool, as, and... Um, we ended up fighting for a title and ended up, you know, sadly knocking him out in the first round and, um, and retired him. But yeah, it was crazy. They say you shouldn't meet your idols because usually you get disappointed, but you oh. take him back to that 12 year old kid and then you, you're there, you're fighting, you've knocked him out. Was it everything you hoped and dreamed for? Was it not yeah. the way you wanted it to go? Well, I actually got scared because <laughs> I was so G'd up and, you know, put, my team can back me up. I was in the change rooms, just so relaxed. And then as soon as I stepped in the ring, mm -hmm. I was like, shit, that's mundane. And I was like, and he was just looking at me and he was like, we didn't like, sh yeah, eyes didn't sh shy away and we are just staring at each other. And then the first jab I threw, he slipped and he popped me with a jab and I was like, oh no, I'm going to be in for a long night. And I was like, Mick, just be present again, mm -hmm. come back to being focused. And, um, and then, yeah, well, a minute later, I ended up knocking and catching him with a big left hook and it was all, but yeah, no, it was all exactly what I expected and more. <laughs> I mean, boxing, it's physical, it's mental, it's emotional. But it's a show. I think more than any other sport, boxing, it's entertainment, it's a show. Is that something you think about or is it that's consequential for the person you are? Like, is there um, a part of you that goes, okay, well, you know. I just, for me, boxing's always been, it's where boys become men. Um, you know, you go in there and, you know, you, the discipline, the dedication, the sacrifice. And then when you get in there, it's like, you could have so many things before the fight, mm -hmm. but fight night is where everything gets settled. Win, lose or draw, that's where everything gets settled. And I've had opponents that I don't get along with, um, you know, and it comes fight time and you settle it. And whether you win, lose or draw, it's done and the emotions are just through the roof. It's just on another level, it's, it's hard to explain because like, how do you explain punching on for 36 <laughs> minutes, you know, like how, and, and it's hard because jumping in with, with a ring with, with a guy that's done nothing to you, mm -hmm. you know, like people say, how do you, how do you get angry? I'm like, I don't get angry, mm -hmm. you know, I just, I just do me. It's like driving. I tell people, I try to explain it to people. It's like driving. You know, when you get in the car, you worry about what you do. Mm -hmm. You know, you just do you. If you have to worry about what everyone else is doing, you drive yourself mad. You know, if I'm worrying about what punches he's going to throw and, you know, what's, what's next, and I just do me. And everything just flows, you know. So on that, lots of people don't like boxing because they see it as aggression, yeah, aggression or, yeah. you know, it's something we, is unnatural that people should be doing. So how mm. do you explain what makes boxing so great? Uh, that's a good question. For me, it's the feeling after. Um, you know, there's no feeling in the world better than, you know, win, lose or draw the fight. Once it's done, it's like, obviously you want to be a winner and it's a much better feeling. But for me, the boxing, despite the actual sport itself, for me, it's about showcasing to the younger and, and giving back. Because there's days that I wake up, I say this all the time, you know, where I'm like, I can't be bothered, I'm this and that, I'm angry and I don't think like, that's how selfish, you know, there's people that sadly are in wheelchairs and, you know, kids that can't see and stuff like that. So I put myself out there to help and give back because, you know, 
it's it's a cruel world as it is, you know what I mean? And like boxing gives you that platform to help others, and I love it. Like the feeling of you know walking to a gym and your kid's face lights up, or even being at events and people come up to me, and it's the best feeling in the world. It's better than boxing. Boxing is just I just have to do boxing to get that. <laughs> you know, if I could do if I could have the same reaction without boxing, I would. The sport for me is just a sport. If I got the same thing dancing or singing, which I can't do both, <laughs> but I would. You know, for me, it's, it's always been, it's each one, teach one for me, give back. So why, why are you Australia's villain? Why, why are you, when I met you, uh, I, I would have thought nothing more opposite than yeah. being Australia's villain. Why um, are you? I think it was because I'm very vocal. Uh, I don't sugarcoat things. What you see is what you get. Uh, if I don't like you, you'll know about it. If I like you, we're mates. But, <laughs> you know, there's been a few opponents where, you know, it's been televised and Fox Sports and mainstream media where I've, I've been very vocal and um, probably too vocal. And it just comes across as arrogance. But it's not really arrogance, it's just, it's just confidence. I believe in my ability, you know. I'm not cocky, I'm just, yeah, just confident. And does it, does it bother you at all? Do you think about, no. oh, I'm Australia's villain, that should be, that's not how I am, you know, that's no. not how my girlfriend sees me. Like. No, it doesn't bother me. Like, the people that are close to me know who I am. People that want to get to know me will. And everyone else, so be it. Yeah, thank you for being my hater. <laughs> it gives me more motivation. Speaking of haters, everyone's got them in this oh, world. Yeah, like social media for you, what do you, is it love thing? Do you hate it? Like, is it just uh, part of the job? Yeah, it's part of the job. I wouldn't have it. Social media is toxic as um, everyone you know puts out a fake life, you know, and I do it too. I'm always smiling. I'm always happy, <laughs> but um, I do it just because obviously it helps my career. But um, yeah, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Haters, if they knew better, they'd be doing better. You know, I, I truly believe that. And I got to a point now where, if I wouldn't ask for your advice. I don't care what you have to say. And it sounds rude, but I mean, people, you see what people write, and I'm like, I've never met you. How are you putting your two cents in? You've got no idea. One, you don't know nothing about boxing. Two, you've never met me. And three, you weren't even there. So I just switch off. But sometimes I like looking at them because then when I go to venues and stuff, I see they'll come up to me, try to talk to me, and I'm like, yeah, it's the same guy, you know? And I, I confront them. I've done it a few times. So talk to me about fight prep. Like, what is. You've got a fight set out, ready to go. How many weeks? How many months? What, what's the preparation look like? So I'm, I overwork. I mean, I'm always two sessions a day. I, it's a lifestyle for me. You mm -hmm. know, if I, even if I was working full time, I'd be training. You know, I just, it's, I like looking good. I like feeling good. Mm -hmm. But I have different, two different mindsets. So when I'm outside of a fight, I just I train to eat. So I love my sweets, chocolate, lollies. So I'll literally train for that. I'll do a 10k run and train my second session knowing I can have my chocolates and sweets. Um, so that's one mindset, and then I'll have my fight where I'm like, I'm training to kill. So for me, it's day to day, two, three sessions a day, um, and it varies between boxing, track work, strength and conditioning, sparring, um, swimming, which I, I hate. You, you, you can probably back me <laughs> up with the water. Um, and then, yeah, recovery. So it varies of a, a bunch of things. And does it vary depending on who you're fighting, or is it this Of is, course, this yeah. Yeah, every, every, everyone's, uh, every opponent's different. So every fight's your first fight because mm -hmm. you're fighting someone different for the first time. Um, and yeah, you stylistically try to match up to these guys that you're fighting. But again, I don't care what they bring because I know what I bring. And that's, mm -hmm. uh, that's where it comes in, it's just confidence. I, just, I know what I can do. I don't care what he's got. You know what I mean, he can be a Ferrari. I just know the shortcuts. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's the key to boxing. It's mindset. Speaking of mindset, what is the mindset when you're leaving the dressing room Crowds going wild, songs are playing, and you're walking up to them. What, what's in your head at that time? Do you, do you even know what's in your head? Yeah I, yeah, I think, like, what am I doing? And then I get in the ring, and it's just like, well, I'm here. Mm -hmm. You know, and it, it, you, take, you have like a quick five second flashback of all the sessions that you've done, the hard work, the sacrifice, the diet, like, just everything you've missed out on. Um, but for me, again, I think of, the people I'm doing it for. Mm. You know, I, I look at my team, I look at my family, you know, and the people that are there. And I think, you know what? All I gotta do is beat this guy in front of me. I want it more than him. I've done it harder than him. And then I just go with him and just do it. And then you're sitting in your corner between rounds and you've got trainers yelling at you, trying yeah, to yeah. fix your face up, you know, trying to do whatever they need to do. Like, are you, where is your head at, at that nah, time? No, I've switched off. Okay. Uh, people, People laugh, but I don't even listen because I look, I do when I'm in the ring because they see things on the outside. But yeah, you know, in the corner, sometimes they say, Oh, Mick, I want you to do this, and I want you to do that. But like, you can't, 
Mm-hmm. Sometimes I can't, it's easy to just go out there. My mum says to me, just go out there, hit him in the rib and just knock him out. <laughs> yeah, mum, it doesn't work like that. Yeah, so like sometimes, you know, you, you hear it, but like you can't go out there. He'll say, oh, Mick, you know, throw that right hand, left hook. And then if I don't see it, I'm not going to do it. You know, so I just go out there and I just, it's just noise. Mm-hmm. And then um, I'll go back to, we're on now, switch on. Let's just do what you do, Mick. I wing it. You know, how do you prepare for the unpredictable? Yeah. I don't know what he's going to throw. Have you ever been scared? Uh, not really. I, uh, I mean, it's, I do and I don't. I don't get really scared as in I don't fear any man. So mm. I don't look at someone and be like, I'm scared. I'll fight anybody. Mm. Um, but the outcome, I get, I get nervous at the outcome because mm. I, I don't know what the outcome is. And for me, that scares me. Am I going to win? Am I going to lose? What if, I do, what if this? And the, all that plays into my mind. But if I stand across the ring and I look you in the eye, I don't, I don't fear you. Have you ever been in a place where you just wanted to end? Yeah, uh, yeah I've had a few fights. Well, Cal Brooks in the first two <laughs> rounds. I was like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> I was like, you know, this is a tough place to be. But um, uh, it's more scarier being ahead and winning. I know it sounds weird, but when, you're, when you've got a guy in front of you that's hungry and wants to win just as much as you do, but you're ahead, mm. it makes it a lot harder because you've got to kind of defend your castle kind of mm-hmm. thing, you know? Like, He's just got nothing to lose, everything in the game, where you've got to, like, I'm winning now, I've got to keep the, that, that, that momentum happening. Mm. But I've never really, like, not wanted to be there, but sometimes mm. I'm like, crap, this is tough. Yeah. You know, Mick, like, you switch off for that second yeah. and you get caught. I did that with the Jeff Horn fight. I don't know if you saw it in the second fight. I, I got up and I, for that second, I took my eye off him and bang. I was on, the next thing you know, I was getting up and I, was like, I had no idea what was going on. The ref was talking, I'm like, move, what are you doing? I hadn't realised I'd just been knocked out. Yeah. Or knocked down. So what does a night before a fight look like? Is have you got a set routine or are you nah, sort of just, I just chill. see what happens? I just chill, I just wing out, I just carve up, yeah. get the food in, hydrate, because the night before we obviously weigh in, mm. we face off, we talk all that crap and mm. then we just yeah, we just chill out. I just eat, take my time, <laughs> two and a half hours, I just smashing carbs. And I just yeah, I just sleep, watch a movie. And fight morning if it's an, if it's you know something that's going to be late at night. When, what does that day look like? So I get up, I have I eat pancakes in the morning. I have that pancakes <laughs> in the morning, and I'll I'll have a big breakfast and a big lunch, and then just hydrate. I won't really have much after that. Mm. And then people like for about eight hours, I won't eat nine hours, and then just before I go out, I have some lollies, and then again, that's it. How hard work's done. Like we close the chapter. Let's just go out there and do it. But I'm pretty chill. Like I get more nervous before the fight. Mm. Yeah, six weeks out, I'm like stressing. I'm like, man, I'm nervous and. People are like, I don't get it. And then in the back rooms, I'm just, I'm dancing. I've got my music going. I'm just like, man, I'm just chill out. I just, because like I tell myself, I'm here now. Mm. I have to go out there. So I might as well be happy and go out there than be unhappy and go out there. And then you've won, you've knocked out someone, you've gone for your 10K run. What does yeah. the next couple of days look like? I mean, how important is it just to get that body recovered and, and rested and, and no, all that sort of stuff? I just straight back in the gym. I don't really recover unless I unless I need work done or or you know I don't really I just yeah I don't really I just straight back to the routine normal I don't change something that's working mm. you know so if I didn't have ice baths and physios and massages and I've won I don't need them you know what I mean like I don't mm. need them I just yeah it's a more all mindset you know people that say oh I need to eat before training it's all rubbish it, it, it's, it doesn't exist if your mind says, I'm going to train, you'll do it. You know, if you really wanted to push through it, you'll do it. So when did mindset and the mental work come into your life? Because I can't imagine the seven-year-olds thinking about mindset, but nah. I imagine at some point this is, yeah. it's, it's come in. Well, recently, I mean, I've been working with a sports psychologist and mm. um, I didn't believe it. I was like, nah, they're just trying to take my money, this and that. And then I've always been tough-minded. I was always like, if it can't be done, I'll do it mm. because I want to be the first one to do it. You know what I mean? And, if someone says, oh, do 10, I'll do 12. I've always just had that mentality, even at seven years old. Yeah. Um, but then to try to channel, channel it in and be like, you know what, being present, mm. that was the key. And mm. I've only been doing that probably the last five years um, where I can just be doing what I do and then it's like they knock on my... That's the scariest when they knock on the change room and they say, Mick, you're running five minutes or you're running three minutes. And then it's like, I used to panic. and be like, where's this, where's that? You know, give me all my stuff. And now I'm just like, cool, man. Like just being real present, focusing and just zoning in that's probably been the last five years yeah and have you seen a benef- benefit from that not just in yourself personally oh, yeah, but in your in your work in your yeah, being yeah. able to train I used to be, so i've got no patience whatsoever and i'm the shortest tempered person you'll probably meet i used to i'd be at a red light 
and I'd turn my whole day upside down because I've waited too long. <laughs> like the sound of a horn will piss me off. Like I just don't have patience, but this new like strategic thing I'm doing now with my breathing and, mm. and focusing on being just present has helped me a lot. Mm. You, c- you can't change it, so why get angry at it? And I, I wish I learned that at seven years old because <clears throat> in the last five years I've done that. You know, like I used to worry about things I can't change. Like it's raining, I'd crack it. You can't change it, Mick. You know what I mean? Like, fuck, what do you want us to do, you know? So. And yeah. do you think that's made you a better fighter now? Or are you a better fighter now? Is this, is this the best you've ever been? The be- yeah, the best is a bit yet to come, I okay. still think. Uh, I'm still maturing as a fighter. And I learn from not what people tell me, I learn from doing it wrong. I, for me, you can't fail at something twice. You know, so if I fail from it, I've learned from it. Mm. If you're failing from it, the same, if you're doing the same thing and you're continuously failing, then you just, it's not meant to be. You know what I mean? So I only ever fail something once and then I'll learn from that. And will we see you and Tim in a ring at some point? It will definitely happen. It will definitely happen um, once he grows a pair and, uh, and steps up. You know, everyone said that I ran away, it wasn't the case. He knows what really happened, but everyone wants to read and see what they like, hear on the media. And, that's fine. I'll just have to shut them up with the win. And what, what will be at the end of the day when you get to a point and you'll be right? I'm I'm satisfied with my career. What does that look like? like I is always that said ten I, more years of fighting. Is yeah. it two more years? Is it ten more world titles? You like never know is... with boxing, you know, because there's always that. Everyone's got that one last fight in them. Um, but for me, I I, I want to enjoy life. I haven't, you know, my, mm. my childhood was pretty tough and stuff, and I haven't really enjoyed life. I've been so dedicated and focus on being a world champion that I haven't really done anything. Um, so for me, I'll, I always said, I don't want to hang in the sport and be like, you know, respectfully like the Mundines and Danny Greens at Sam Solomon's that fought on for too long. Mm. I want to fight for a world title, win it and defend it for as long as I can. And then once I lose it, that's, that's it. You know, hang them up and, um, and start a new journey, a new chapter in my life. With a bit more relaxing. A bit more, yeah, a bit more chilled out. <laughs> yeah, Jesus Christ. It's been on the go 24 seven. But it's good, I, I wouldn't change it for the world. And um, I've had a hard life, I've missed out on a lot of things and opportunities, but it's maybe who I am today. Mm. And I wouldn't change it for the world. Uh, we are here, we're in the ring, we're in your, you know, your home turf, um, Fight Academy. So how do you feel about teaching me a few things? Well, I've heard you, you can throw a good right hand, so let's, <laughs> let's see what we've got. You know? I've heard I you can throw them, so. so we'll see what, we can, uh, what we're working with, 100%. Michael, the basic of basics. Skippy rope. rope. <laughs> Tell me, what do I need to know? So everyone makes the mistake by jumping too high. You only need to jump this high. Mm-hmm. So when you're doing it, start off with just uh, straight, double feet. Surely, surely I can do that. Yep. And now to get the famous boxing step, just start on one foot. <laughs> That's it. Once you go on one foot, eventually okay. we'll get tired. I'm gonna end up oh, one foot the whole time. And then. Oh, God. Go the other foot, and eventually that will get tired. And then That's you will really be able to hop on, on each foot. How do foot. I keep changing? Okay. That's it, exactly like that. <laughs> Perfect. If you, ju- if you jump a little bit. But do you kick your legs out, or no. what are you doing? So it's not a little. Oh, just you're not kicking your legs. Okay. Yeah, see how I'm not jumping high? You're going. Oh, you're. <laughs> you're Irish dancing. <laughs> well, Irish that's probably dance. more natural for me. There you go. But now I feel like I'm kicking them back. <laughs> it looked like a seal out of water. <laughs> nah, here, look. Well, this. That's it, perfect. Now, nothing changes, just go one foot. <laughs> so from, from this, you go one, one, one. That's it. We got you there. Yeah. What, did it, like 20 seconds? <laughs> All right, so jab is this. That's a right hand, all right, so jab, one. Yeah, see how you're square, like stay there? Yeah. Look how this much. Yeah. See you're pushing? See, when I'm here, if I, you try to push me now, I'm not going anywhere, see what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm here, and I'm not even putting my weight, I'm just th- there, so try to, s- the lower you go, the more, yeah, better. Better, better, I said better. <laughs> huh. Hands up, all right, jab. Good, right hand. Good, one, like two. You- and not about, you've got good power. See, so you don't lean forward, so sit more back on that leg. That's it, now throw the right hand. So you've got more power there. That was actually not about right hand. <laughs> right hand. Good, jab. One, two. Good, oh. yeah, so go one, two, rip. Okay, yeah. So one, two, rip. That's it, nice, again. One, two, 
I'm going to end up with my teeth on the floor. I feel no, you won't. So slow. Won't. So it should look like this. Ready? One, two, rip. Okay. One, two. You're good. Perfect. Again. One, two. Yeah, there we go. One, two. Right, and then come back with the right hand after that. Jesus. Oh. <laughs> after that. All right. So it's exact on. One, two. And then right. Good. That's it. So torsion your body now to, to one, two, three, four. Good. Then you can come back with a hook. So do it slow. Slow. <laughs> two, three, four. Four. Little steps. So four. One, two, three, four. Jesus. Good. Yeah, that's it. Good. Again. One, two, three, four. Good. Not bad. Jab. Good. Hands up. Get hit. Jab. Right. Double jab. She wants to knock me out. SAS wasn't enough. <laughs> One, two. Yeah, see? And then it sets up other punches. See yep. when you twist, you, you can just keep throwing. Just get tired. Okay. One more. Ready? One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, see? Well done. Got there. There's nothing quite like being ringside with a pretty boy. I know Mick's got big things ahead and I look forward to seeing what's next for him. We look forward to seeing you for the next episode of The Backstory. Thanks to our friends at P3 Recovery for their support. Welcome to P3 Recovery Centre, a state-of-the-art recovery and wellbeing facility right here in the heart of Burley on the Gold Coast. Come with me, I'll take you for a tour.